So today we'll be looking at the concepts of statites or static satellites and several variations of them like the Ligite, Quasite, Magsail, and Solar Moth. One of the difficulties of doing a show focused on space and the distant future and the cool things we might find and build out there is that we often have concepts we use a lot that are not even vaguely household concepts, and I end up discussing them quickly in an episode focused on something else but which requires that topic. I created the Megastructure Compendium a couple years back as a handy reference for a lot of them, but as I was writing and recording this month's episode on Lagrange Point Settlement, I found myself discussing lagites and statites and I explained them but neither they or the compendium really allowed us to discuss what these things are, what all their variants are, and what their limitations and changes are, and any of the really cool things we can do with them, some of which, like star lifting or shikata thrusters, have their own episodes. We should start with the basic concept though. Smaller things orbit much larger bodies at a rate determined from that bigger object's mass and how close it is. The further away you are, the slower you orbit, and the more massive it is, the faster you orbit. This means around any big body there's a fairly limited number of options for where you are orbiting at and none of them are stationary, with the kinda sorta exception of a geostationary orbit and its equivalent around other bodies besides Earth. If we imagined I want to put a big solar collector in near Mercury or closer where we could get maximum efficiency without melting, then beam that energy back to Earth. I've got the problem that my satellite orbiting out there is not doing so every 365.25 days, but rather might be doing it every 80 days, and that makes for quite a pain for keeping that beam on track even when it's not got the sun in the way or some other orbiting body or space station that might pass through its no-fly zone of safety. This is where the statite can help out because we could just hang it right over the sun's north pole. Statites are short for static satellites and were introduced as a concept by physicist and sci-fi writer Robert L. Forward in 1993, and the idea is amazingly simple and a bit of a misnomer. A statite isn't orbiting at all, and unlike the lagite, which we'll get to in a moment, isn't a satellite. It's a solar sail that hovers over a bright object held by radiant pressure of photons. Think of a sheet of paper hanging over a heat vent, blown up by it and pulled down by gravity. Same idea but easier to control. Partially because most stars are decently stable in their output of light, our sun particularly so, and very stable in gravity. The light coming off a star drops with the inverse square of distance and so does gravity. They weaken at the same rate, so light twice as far from Earth is a quarter of its strength and gravity is a quarter of its strength there too. Making these work at a practical level is a bit trickier but conceptually it is simple. For any given star, there is a cross-sectional density a sheet of reflective material would have that would cause it to float in place, make it a bit thinner and it will blow away, a bit thicker and it will fall down, stick it around a dimmer star and it will fall down. Big giant stars could be thousands or even millions of times brighter than our sun while only having 10 or 20 times the mass or gravity, while red dwarfs might be a tenth our sun's mass and not even a thousandth as bright. This massively affects how this technology works in other star systems and so too with things like high star variability, binary partners, or a large hot Jupiter nearby. Though again a statite hanging over our sun's north pole could be closer than Mercury or further than Pluto and still work the same way. Again the light and gravity both diminish at the same rate. From this spot a giant power collector could beam energy back to Earth, or any other planet or the asteroid belt as those all generally orbit around the equator of the Sun and thus are visible from above or below the Sun all of the time. Now how thick does this sail need to be in order to be stationary? Again it's very dependent on the star in question, but it can be many thousands of times thicker around a big supergiant. For our Sun, which generates about 10 micronewtons per square meter out here near Earth and which generates about 6 micronewtons per gram of material out here, gravitationally, that means whatever you're using needs to be pretty thin. The good news is that if you reflect sunlight away rather than absorbing it, you double the radiant pressure it exerts, so a shiny surface might allow more than 3 grams per square meter. A gram isn't much, but we're talking tissue paper or aluminum foil thickness and thin sheets at that. So for moving sunlight around this works, that works for your typical Chicago thruster around a star like our own, 
but even doing power generation might require some special materials like graphene to permit something thin enough to also handle the weight of some machinery and computers hanging down from it. And if you imagine a statite as a big parachute with some module attached, that's about right. Gravity slowly pulls it down but sunlight blows it back up, like a strong wind up from the ground right on that parachute. In the solar system, away from a planet, the sun is down. It also makes star boosting tricky around suns much dimmer than our own, which are exactly the kinds you want to star boost normally, to make hotter and brighter. We have four fixes for this. The first is better materials, and honestly those better materials should be doable but regardless anything that makes it easier is better. Graphene can be made very thin, even thin enough for a red dwarf, and has great tensile or hanging strength, though ensuring it's opaque or reflective at those minuscule thicknesses or surface densities might be pushing it for the smallest and dimmest stars. The second option is to use pushing beams to achieve a higher density, and you might do this in cases like trying to keep a statite over a planet or some other gravitating body that doesn't give off much light for unit of mass, as an alternative to the poor sitter option we'll discuss later. You can use a surface based laser to hover an object over our atmosphere, but this does need to be pretty powerful since Earth's gravity near its surface is more than a thousand times stronger than the Sun's gravity out here is. We have materials reflective enough to take a beam a thousand times stronger than the sun at full noon without melting, but we also have geostationary orbits and other forms of active support that are more power efficient. One of those would be running charged objects like ions at a magnetic field to carry momentum up to it, hand it over and fall back down, caught on the drop to regenerate momentum and be shoved back up again, rinse and repeat. They are going to be a much better approach in cases like this and so is solar wind, the other thing coming off the sun. Solar sail is a term a lot of folks have heard but which is a bit nebulous as it can also include not just radiant pressure of sunlight, or focused beams of light, but different wavelengths the sun doesn't produce much of, like microwaves, and also charged particles and arguably spills over into magnetic sails or mag sails. Much as statite is basically a slightly heavier solar sail, a slightly heavier mag sail would do the job too, hovering stationary, and an object could be using any combination of these, sunlight, laser, maser, beam, solar wind, or a particle cannon or matter beam shoving on it. At the bigger scale, it could be pods containing matter or supplies fired out of a mass driver that it caught down a long reverse driver of its own. It could also be some massive asteroid hanging over a planet that was using sunlight to power a giant mass driver that fired slugs of matter down to the planet below, which might be for industrial uses or might be some sort of orbital bombardment siege cannon that was constantly falling and popping back up from the recoil whenever it fired. Those all probably deserve their own specific name but I already coined the term of our fourth option so I figure I've hit my quota. Our fourth option is the Lagite and combines a normal orbit with radiant pressure or beams of light or matter or solar wind to produce a non-Keplerian orbit, one that either isn't a circle or ellipse or just has the wrong orbital period for its distance. This can include artificial Lagrange points. This category of variant got that name from me way back in 2016 when the channel was young and I was discussing Chicago thrusters and my interest at the time was having large reflective solar mirrors orbiting a star at an atypical period, mostly let sunlight through to planets around that star while you moved it. These are satellites that are not static but rather lag behind their normal orbit, hence a lagging satellite or lagite, rather than a static satellite or statite. Thus they might be where an orbit should only be a few months but have a lagging orbital period of exactly one year so as not to block light from Earth while maximizing the light a Shikata thruster or other stellar engine or Dyson swarm could get. I am attached to the name and it seems a good fit, but I am hesitant to claim the concept as my own, as I am guessing others thought it up before at some point. Colin McGinnis suggested using solar sails for a type of halo orbit even before Forward patented the statite and my friend David Kipping from Cool Worlds independently came up with the Quasite not long after, which overlaps a fair amount and while I like my name better that's also a pretty good name, especially in the context he was discussing them, which also discusses using them as a possible techno signature for aliens and the Fermi Paradox, 
if you have not ever watched an episode of Cool Worlds, he has a very good catalog including Quasites, and he also did a paper discussing them as techno Sanchos. To give an example of how these could be a techno Sancho, let us imagine I found a star with a nice planet we could terraform, only it's a bit far from its sun, which is a weaker orange dwarf. Our baseline statite cloud could be composed of tons of reflective mirrors aimed right back down at that sun, mostly over its poles. Probably these would be large pale bulk dishes to make it easier to reflect light back down on that sun, again picture a parachute. It absorbs that light in its photosphere and it raises the temperature of that star in general, making it brighter. For a simple first approximation, if half its light is bounced back down all the time, it will reach an equilibrium when the total coming out and staying out matches the original. In such a case that star's surface temperature is going to go up and now matches our sun's spectrum and emits more net light into that equatorial band. If half that light were blocked, we would assume the black body temperature of that star had to rise to produce twice as much sunlight, which goes with a fourth power of temperature so would be a rise in temperature of 15%, around 900 Kelvin in this case. We use this approach with the Outerson Disk BWC megastructure and also works for Dyson Swarms where you want to build it more stably as a wide equatorial torus that would be bigger than the default equatorial region Dyson Swarm there would otherwise be. In that regard I would expect this style of star boosting to be fairly common, or its variant where those polar mirrors just deflect light back down on the wider equatorial region. They are all secondary effects and this is also the basic method we use for pushing off more solar wind to engage in star lifting, which also uses a statite or lagite hybrid as the pump for taking matter off the star's surface. This isn't an episode on star boosting though or on star lifting, so we'll bypass further discussion. Using this method you can also make the star's radiant pressure rise and thus permit a thicker or more massive statite. However, if you're starting with a very dim star, you can opt to deploy lagites orbiting that star and they are very flat and thin satellites, so with a little guidance they can alter their profile to turn perpendicular or parallel to the sunlight. In this way, you could have a large collector array orbiting a star in polar orbits or equatorial and they could simply turn parallel to the sunlight when they are passing in between that sun and its planet you want that light to get to. It will begin to fall until you turn it perpendicular again but a statite would fall faster, since it has no orbital momentum. Now these would never be a simple flat sheet. Likely it's a flat reflective surface or even pinwheel with a couple spots that are solar panels to run a computer and to run some winches. You probably spin it so that centrifugal force spreads it out and constrict it back in with those winches and some wires. Again it might come to resemble a parachute. You build it bigger and thinner than needed to stay where it should and it maintains active balance by relaxing its pull if it's dropping and pulling it tighter if it's gotten a bit too far from the star, and it can pull in one side or spread out another to turn or reposition. This works with any of the versions, statite or lagite, or ones using magnets and solar wind. For solar wind you have simple wires spread out as a mag sail that deflects solar wind and this can actually be a lot thinner and bigger than one running on radiant pressure. Now the primary value of a lagite is for creating fake Lagrange points, where you can't have something like a solar shade or power beam or remain fixed with a planet just like its L1 would, or to engage in free station keeping for very massive space stations in Trojan Lagrange points or even a modest solar mirror or sail could keep an enormous and dense station where it needs to be. We'll discuss those more in that Lagrange Point Settlement episode in a month that I mentioned, but the one key takeaway for now is about lagites being used to widen Lagrange Points. If I put an enormous solar shade at Venus's L1 Lagrange Point with the Sun, it will block sunlight from reaching Venus and let us cool it down and then we can terraform it, as we explain in Winter on Venus. However, let us imagine four different objects out there. One is a simple wire mesh that's transparent to light and which solar wind would blow through unaffected. This needs to be at the normal L1 Lagrange point to stay where it should be, doing whatever it is supposed to do. If we charge that up to be a solar wind deflector, as we discussed for use at the Martian L1 to minimize atmospheric stripping as an artificial magnetosphere, that solar wind will push that mesh back and away 
which means it won't be stable there and we need to put it closer to the Sun to keep it in a quasi L1 stationary position with Venus or Mars in this case. If instead we use an opaque sunshade it gets pushed by sunlight it absorbs too, thus we'll also need to be closer to the Sun to be a stable L1-like actor than the normal L1 spot, and it would be different than if we made it reflective instead, which would double the push, as would hybrids that do both. These will never be one big sheet either, thousands of kilometers wide, but rather those of smaller sheets, maybe just a kilometer wide, which is why the ability to quarter the light is important. They can shift their direction left or right or north or south instead of just radially outward or inward. Individual sheets can then hang out to the side of the L1 or modified L1 and stay there by tilting themselves a bit. Though some big conglomeration of sheets can also be kept in touch and tweak position with thin tethers connecting them, at all times perhaps, or just firing one off to connect to a neighbor and pull them in and then disconnect. The ability to alter their reflectivity or use different colors reflected to some wavelengths may also be handy, especially in hybrids like a farming station that let green light in but reflected the others away. Such relatively low mass and reflective stations might tend to occupy the rural outskirts of a Lagrange Point settlement region for that reason. What this means is that you can get some very large Lagrange Point-like regions and put artificial structures in those that can maintain true stability of position with that constant positional tweaking. The thinner one is, the further to the edge of the Lagrange region they can be. This is not just an inner system advantage either, out in deep space where gravity is so light that objects can take centuries to orbit, like Neptune, we have the ability to create what we call a parabolic hab, and these are big cylinder habitats with huge but thin and light parabolic dishes behind them focusing sunlight into them for warmth, sun, and power, and again this is likely to be many small mirrors acting as a parabolic dish. When it's twilight or nighttime they can swivel off the ones not being used specifically for power generation to engage in station keeping too. Instead of orbiting at the normal rate they could have a far longer orbital period or far shorter period or remain stationary as a de facto statite, especially around brighter stars. With some tinkering we can also adjust asteroids in the belt to be L2 Lagrange point-like objects, speeding their orbits so they matched Earth, or simply other nearby but closer asteroids they wish to form a long-term economic tie to, though in many cases a tether, as an actual and literal tie, might serve better. One other note on that. Comets are weak lagite-like objects as the sun ablates gas and dust off them as tails that push in a different direction than gravity is pulling and thus alter their orbit more than modestly. We can stage that up and it is the idea behind the solar moth, which uses sunlight focused on a supply of fuel to be heated and vaporized and emitted in the direction of your choosing. Now we've been talking about applications of these close to the sun or far out in space but not near Earth except an application to expanding Lagrange points or doing station keeping, and again we'll discuss that more in Lagrange Point Settlement, but there are near-Earth applications and one of those is creating a completely new quasi-Lagrange point, such as one hovering not over the Sun's north or south pole but over Earth's, something geostationary but over the poles or just not over the equator. This is called a poor sitter and there are ways to do it with either a normal statite that Earth is dragging along or a tilted lagite that's deflecting light from the Sun at an angle to create a push from Earth as well, you can even do cylindrical orbits around planets. If your materials are good enough and thin you can use as a type of polar space elevator by having a large collection of thin and spinning mirrors tilted to bounce sunlight to push up from Earth, and again is essentially a form of active support at this point. I should note that we have discussed something similar both for slowing or speeding the rotational rate of a planet on top of a space tower or pushing a planet further from its star to cool it and protect it from a subgiant or red giant phase of that star as it nears death. Different construct but also use the sun's light and solar wind to do your work for you. As for the poor sitter, you could intentionally break this light into two or more directions so it went either side of Earth, but if you wish this could also be used to warm a polar region of a planet. You can also use these same methods to add sunlight to a planet or add certain wavelengths you find beneficial or remove certain wavelengths you feel harmful, or to deflect solar wind around to help minimize atmospheric stripping and ionizing radiation near your planet, making orbital facilities and ships safer. 
The amount of material necessary to entirely englobe our Sun in such statites at about 3 grams per square meter, and let's say 50 million kilometers radius from the Sun, a bit less than Mercury's distance, is 10 to the 20 kilograms, not even a thousandth of Mercury's mass, or just seven thousandths of our Moon's mass, and probably made out of aluminum or carbon or some other abundant material. I can't really see any colonization effort at a new star not having enough mass for one. We have individual asteroids that could supply all that raw material themselves, and there's no sophistication to it requiring advanced AI and automation to make. Grab rock? Crush rock. Melt out metal or separate out carbon, churn out thin flat reflective sheets. Attach a computer no stronger than needed to run an old Nintendo. Repeat. You could likely create one within a few decades of arriving at a new star system and using no dangerously sophisticated AI, and now you're a Kardashev II civilization even though you've only got a colony ship of a few hundred thousand people, and maybe millions more coming in faster on follow-up ships your new pushing array can be used to slow down. And now you have total access to all the power of that star. You can move it using a Shikata thruster or one of the other variants we discussed in Fleet of Stars or the Megastructural Compendium. You can move whole armadas of space arcs out to claim the galaxy, pushed by laser or ion beams, or you can weaponize it into some terrifying Death Star that can sterilize a whole galaxy. You can use it to run the settlement of that system, harvest that star for planets worth of heavy elements, dump the excess power into Kugelblitz black holes for long-term storage as batteries, good for quadrillions of years, or use it to power relativistic spaceships. This is what statites, lagites, and other variants let us do, and by now I'm sure you see why we discuss them in passing in so many of our episodes about mega engineering and our future in the cosmos. They are simple, but they are the keys to the Kardashev scale, and the reason why even a civilization that wanted to stay in one system, or even on one planet, would still want to deploy these technologies. And I believe we will within this century, and use them to unlock the doorway to the galaxy. So today we were discussing enormous objects in space that might help us forge our future, but another enormous thing in space that might affect our future is giant space monsters, and this month's Nebula exclusive, we'll be examining everything from huge space kraken, the kaiju, and the sandworms of Dune to ask what science tells us about their biology and if we might end up encountering, or even engineering, enormous space creatures. That's out now exclusively on Nebula, our streaming service, where you can see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad-free, and all our other bonus content, including extended editions of mini-episodes and more Nebula exclusives like Giant Space Monsters, The Fermi Paradox, Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis, Ultra Relativistic Spaceships, Dark Stars at the Beginning of Time, Life as an Asteroid Minor, Nomadic Minors on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, Colonizing Binary Stars, and more. Nebula has tons of great content from an ever-growing community of creators. Using my link and discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during the episode. When you sign up at my link, go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur, and use my code IsaacArthur, you not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, like giant space monsters, you also be directly supporting this show. Again, to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. One of the more interesting alternatives for encountering non-human intelligence in the future is that it might be intelligence we engineered, such as making animals smarter, a process we call uplifting, and this Thursday we'll discuss the ethical challenges of that endeavor. Then on January 14th, it will be time for Sci-Fi Sunday and a look at two other types of inhuman intelligence, aliens and AI, and which is a greater threat to us and who would win a fight between the two and we'll discuss regulating space on January 18th. Then we'll talk about settling all the garage points and why a society at L5 would be awesome. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, 
and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, isaacalfo.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like giant space monsters at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.